All right, can we do this now? Can it function? Is it functioning? Has anyone seen the continual transfunction there? All right, I'll go to Mima. Help me. Help me. Does anybody like Ramstein? Am I the only mofo who likes Ramstein around here? Anyway, I suppose I should probably hop right the hell on into this. Although it would, uh, it would be very upsetting if the stream dies again. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it will. The health of the stream appears to be excellent, so... May, uh, may Hermes smile upon our transmissions. Anyhow. <coughs> As you can see, I've compiled the notes. That's, that's my handwriting. And yeah, I'm just going to dictate straight from the book here. <clears throat> the Nine Realms of Yggdrasil. Having now examined the true meaning of the verses of the Havamal and discovered the 18 runes hidden within the poem, we must now move on and discover the true significance of the Riddle of the Nine Knights and learn why it was Odin's sacrifice was that Odin's sacrifice lasted for such a specific number of nights. In short, why nine? Because you went full nine, man. As discussed in the chapter Odin, the Dark God of the Runes, the world tree Yggdrasil plays a central role in runic mysticism and magic. Indeed, its importance cannot be overstated. It is the core component, bringing together all the variant elements of runic mysticism into one unified system. Yggdrasil itself consists of nine realms that are interconnected by a number of different paths allowing passage between the realms. Whilst in this respect it is similar to the Hebrew Kabbalah, Yggdrasil is seen more as representative of the entire Norse cosmology and by extension the entire universe. Yggdrasil can also be described as encapsulating the whole of human consciousness, from the highest ideals to the depths of our inner being, and even beyond that to the collective unconscious, as en as as envisaged and en envisaged by the Swiss psychologist Karl Mayniger Gustav Jung. Indeed, the concepts proposed by Jung are a subject that we will turn to later. In the classical mythology of Northern Europe, Yggdrasil is portrayed as a tree and normally depicted as being either an ash or yew. Yggdrasil extends from Asgard in the heavens, through Midgard, the human world, and down to Helheim, the Germanic equivalent of the underworld. Although, as we will see, Helheim is a far more complex realm than simply an abode of evil, Yggdrasil's branches extend out to encompass the realms of Jotunheim, Muspelsheim, while the realm of Niflheim is located beneath, the trunk of Yggdrasil also passes through the realms of light, Losalfheim, and darkness, Svartalsheim. While Vanaheim, the ancient realm of the Vanir, is to be found another is to be found on another outlying branch. Yggdrasil is, according to the mythology, inhabited by various creatures and spirits. These include, at Vanaheim, the three Norn sisters Erd, Redandi, and Skuld, the three fates who are perpetually deciding the fate of human beings. Midgard itself is surrounded by a vast ocean that is inhabited by the great sea serpent Jormungandr, who is so huge that he encircles the world entirely and grasps his own tail, thus creating a complete circle. In this respect, Jormungand can be compared to the Ouroboros of Western alchemy, a dragon or snake which is perpetually consuming its own tail, thus symbolizing eternity. Jormungand's presence ensures that nothing can pass directly to or from Midgard, thus keeping it safe. It is, however, possible to pass from Midgard to Asgard via the Bifrost Bridge. Bifrost connects the realm of mortals, Midgard to the realm of the gods, Asgard, which the gods must travel daily to hold their councils and pass judgments over men. At the very base of Yggdrasil lays the dragon Nidhogg, who perpetually gnaws at the roots of the tree, threatening to destroy it. All this paints a picture of a mythic world rich with mystery and magic. But how does this all link to the runes? But how, you might ask? 
The Runes and the Realms of Yggdrasil As the runes in Yggdrasil are such key elements in northern magic, there have been many attempts to link the various Futharks with the nine realms of Yggdrasil, the World Tree. But since the number of runes in each Futhark makes for an unequal division of runes when matched up with Yggdrasil, these attempts have proved problematic at best. Consider, for example, there are 24 runes in the Eldar or Germanic rune Futhark. 24 does not equally divide into 9. Any attempt to combine these runes with Yggdrasil results in an uneven spread. There is also This is also true of the 16 runes of the Younger Futhark, and the upwards of 33 of the Anglo-Saxon. Only the 18 runes of the Armin and Futhark uniquely divide into 9. This is achieved by combining the two runes of the Armin and Futhark to create a bind rune, whose meaning is a combination of the two separate meanings for each rune. However, this chance of mathematics that 18 so easily divides into 9 is certainly not the only reason why this is the case. If one examines the details of the meaning of each of the 18, it is clear that they encapsulate the meaning of the realms of Yggdrasil, but only when the correct two are bound up is this fact clear. Allow me to restate this. As it's of supreme importance, these newly created Bayan runes match up perfectly with the realms of Yggdrasil. The combined the mean of the combined mean of the two runes is the same as the meaning of the realm. But before we explore the relationship between the Supreme Nine, we must first consider how the Eighteen are matched to produce the Nine Supreme Bind Runes. The Nine Knights of Odin As with the true definitions of the Eighteen Runes, we can once again turn to the Havamal for a clear indication that this should not be done, but was in fact one of the forms of transmission of these runic mysteries. However, hey, typo. Even before the 18 runes are revealed, Odin is made aware of the existence of the Nine Mighty Songs, that hint to the existence of the Nine Bind runes that exemplify the realms of Yggdrasil. The verse of the Havamal, which deals, deals, come on now, directly with the Nine Bind runes, is verse 139, which states, Nine mighty songs I learned from the great song of Baelthorn, bestless sire. I drank a measure of the wondrous mead with the soul stirrer's drops I was showered. That is, of course, spoken by the All Father Odin. Thus, Odin has already been given a clue regarding the existence of the powerful nine Armin and Bind runes. However, they are disguised as songs and are yet to be linked to the nine worlds of Yggdrasil. But the clues are there to be found, for when one examines the lineage and heritage of Baelthorn, who is the grandfather of this unnamed teacher of Odin, we discover that this is in fact Odin's own grandfather, and Bestla is Odin's mother. Thus, we have another mystical. Um, Tri triu trium virate. What the fuck does that mean? T r i u m v i r a t e. Similar to Odin Vilive, of whom we spoke earlier, which is which I did not speak earlier because I'm not just gonna read the whole book to you. <coughs> And here we find again the importance of the 3918 numeric sequence, which seems to be at the very heart of the Odinic mysteries. Three brothers, nine realms, songs and knights, and 18 runes. So we can see that when Odin speaks of being taught by the great son of Baelthorn, he is actually speaking to himself. And the idea that Odin is speaking to himself of these nine mighty songs is also a reflection of the approaching act of self-sacrifice, which Odin specifically describes as a sacrifice to my own self-given, and which Odin knows must last nine nights. Thus Odin was given an insight into the runes and the nine mighty songs that result from the eighteen Arminen runes being twined into the nine bind runes of Yggdrasil. But it is clear from the point of view of this sacrifice that Odin is dividing himself in order to make a journey ultimately of self-discovery. But in doing so, he discovers not only the eighteen runes, but also how they can be linked directly to Yggdrasil. Odin's journey inwards starts with the self-sacrificing hanging himself from Yggdrasil, the windswept tree. Verse 137 of the Havamal states, I, tr 
I trow I hung on that windy tree nine whole days and nights, stabbed with a spear, offered to Odin, myself to my own self given, high on that tree of which none hath heard, from what roots it rises to heaven. And ends at verse 164 with... The wise one has spoken words in the hall, needful for men to know, unneedful for trolls to know. Hail to the speaker, hail to the knower, joy to him who has understood, delight to those who have listened. The hall, of course, being Valhalla in, in Asgard. Thus Odin's journey is complete, and he returns to Asgard replete with knowledge not only of himself, but also of the runes, and most importantly, how to traverse the realms of Yggdrasil thanks to the magic of the Nine Mighty Songs that are the Armin and Bind runes of Yggdrasil. But what are these Nine Mighty Songs that are the Nine Armin and Bind runes? Armin and Bund runes? Come on now, typos. Why does this book have so many fuck typos? I want, I want my money back. Which are the runes that fit so perfectly together that they unlock the entire world tree and allow us to travel through the realms. Yo, this ain't no fucking sword fight. Well, it's gonna be, eventually. Alright, Mr. Johnson. Which are the... Which are the runes that fit so perfectly together that they unlock the entire world tree and allow us to travel through the realms? The final verse of the Have of Maul makes it clear that it is needful for men to know. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, Johnson. I shit post too, it's okay. It is needful for men to know. And that Odin will teach the worthy. But Odin is not with us, so we must discover for ourselves which runes match up and open the way to Yggdrasil. However, before we can do that, we must first familiarize ourselves with the nine realms of Yggdrasil. Alright, now we can get into the juice. The nine realms of Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil is more normally depicted as an actual tree, however, for clarity, this stylized image is preferable for understanding the realms. Note the four directions. Now, I fucking... There's, there's one little piece of data I didn't jam into this picture, but you go down here to Niflheim, that is north, Muspelsheim south, Jotunheim east, Vanaheim west. So, it's, this is not a two-dimensional... Uh, well, idea. Obviously, this is two-dimensional right now on, on your on your screen, but for the sake of, of understanding, try to imagine it as being three-dimensional. Note the four directions. Yggdrasil should not be regarded as a two-dimensional image. The four worlds surrounding Midgard are on the same horizontal plane, so Yggdrasil should be regarded as a three-dimensional glyph. The higher realms. The two highest realms are... Asgard, realm of the gods, the Allfather, realm of higher consciousness. Asgard is the realm of the most high of the northern traditions. It is the abode of Odin and of Valhalla, the hall of the slain. It is also the abode of Freya, the wife and equal of Odin. Traditionally, Asgard is surrounded by a high wall, with Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, being the only point of access into this realm. Esoterically, this is the realm of spirit misspelled in my book, and highest ideas, the realm to which the rune master desires to accent once, to accent, ascent, desires to ascend, ah, uh, fucking, once Odin's journey has been completed, and it is only with the knowledge of the runes that one is able to pass Heimdall, the guardian of the bridge, and enter the realm of, of the gods. Yes, you must study to enter we got a party going on up in Asgard, but you have to uh, know, know the password, though. Lothalfheim. The abode of mind and meaning the expanse of light. Traditionally, Lothalfheim, or Alfheim, is seen as the abode of the light elves, who are linked to the Vanir, whom the Aesir defeated. These elves represent the light of learning and knowledge. This is, therefore, esoterically, the realm from which the brightness and light of the human intellect is derived. Therefore, Losalfheim is also the seat of Hyoga, excuse me, or thought. I'm gonna have to watch later. I've been interested in interesting effects. 
I can't, oh, I can't even read all, all of your comment. Well, I can see that you have to go. Yeah, 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 I, I, I do these streams because I'm out of storage space. You go right on ahead. <clears throat> also, the seed of the contemplation is just memory. Low self time is also the realm of fertility, enabling conscious life to begin first as ideal before that ideal extends downwards into Midgard. The worlds in the four directions and the world of man. The expansion of the worlds beyond man. To the east lies Jotunheim, a realm of change and transformation. Traditionally, this is the realm the fire giants who will aid in the final destruction of the world at the Ragnarok. Esoterically, this is the realm of constant change and transformation. <laughs> However, the realm itself does not change but engenders change in all that meets it. This is therefore the realm of constant motion and transformation. It is also the realm of the seasons, ensuring the germination of the seed, the growth of the crop, the reaping of the harvest, and the recovery of the land awaiting a new plantation. To the west lies Vanaheim, realm of coalescence and growth. Vanaheim represents fruition, the harvest and productivity. It is also the realm of personal growth and the cycle of the seasons. Traditionally, Vanaheim is the home of the Vanir, the elder gods who the Aesir replaced, and is, and is from Freya of the Vanir that Odin first learnt the secrets of magic, through the sacrifice of an eye in order to drink from Mimir's well. Mimir was a fellow Vanir. Esoterically, Vanaheim is the realm of generation and growth, but with this growth comes learning and the ever unquenchable desire for more wisdom and understanding. But this desire to grow is not actuated here, for this is the realm of static fruition, where the growth is merely engendered but not actuated. The motion of actuation lies elsewhere. To the south lies Muspelsheim. The realm of fire and heat. Muspelsheim is the diametric opposite of Niflheim. Its fiery sparks are a creative force and expansive, therefore the opposite of Niflheim's constrictive influence. It is the force of expansion and ever-increasing power, forever generating and intensifying. It is from the heart of this realm that the positive expansive power of the All Runa can be detected, again making it the antithesis of Niflheim. In mythology, Muspelsheim is the home of the fire giants that will initiate Ragnarok, the end of the world according to northern mythology. But even these mighty creatures can only exist at the very edge of this realm of pure energy. To the north lies Niflheim, the realm of, of ice, destruction, and end complete. Niflheim is the realm of ice and mists, it is said to be populated by those who have lived a cruel life, criminals, etc. But these beings are static, frozen by the ice of Niflheim. It is therefore also the realm of inertia and stillness, and is located just above Helheim. Traditionally, this is the realm to which Hel, the goddess of death, fell, and it is from here it is said that she built Helheim. Niflheim is also known as the land of magnetism and constriction, and at its very heart is the point into which the entire universe will be pulled and the end of days, Ragnarok. At the end of days? The end of the world according to northern mythology. The end of the world as we smell it. Therefore, it is is possible to perceive the all runa's influence and pull at the centre of this deadly realm. Am I the only one who hates the word centre? Jesus Christ, like you you're not cool. Just spell it center. It's E R. God damn. At the exact equidistance between the four realms of Jotunheim, Vanheim, Niflheim, and Muspelsheim lies the Midgard, the home of mankind. At the centre Liaise, Midgard, a realm of manifestation where all worlds meet. 
Midgard is the realm of humanity and where all life has its material being. This is the realm of physical manifestation and concrete existence. Midgard itself is surrounded by a great ocean, beyond which nothing can pass. Traditionally, this ocean is seen as inhabited by Jormungand, a great sea serpent who will destroy all life with its venom at the arrival of Ragnarok. Jormungand is described as having grown so large that it now surrounds the whole of Midgard and holds its own tail in its mouth thus completing the circle. Esoterically, Midgard represents the physical realm, but differs from other systems by placing this realm at the very heart of the schematic, rather at the base, as suggested by other systems. Midgard itself occupies the center between Muspelsheim and Niflheim, where these two polaric forces meet, and it is the balancing of these two extremes that engenders all life in the beginning. The gods did not create life itself, but the Odin Vili Vetrayun brought mankind into existence, with each giving man an aspect of his being that combined to form consciousness, emotions, and will. The Lower Realms Svartalsheim The realm of emotion and instinct, the realm of becoming. Traditionally, Svartalsheim is the realm of the Dark Elves, or Dwarves, who are the great forgers and makers slowly shaping things into being. Esoterically, this is the realm of the emotions, and as such, a reflection of Losafheim, the realm of intellect. Svartalsheim is also the realm of formation, where life a fashioned is fashioned and shaped into being, although nothing is actually born here, as this can only occur in Midgard. The power that emanates from Svartalsheim rises up and reaches to the very threshold of Midgard, but never directly penetrates the land of man. However, the creative force is carried through all the realms through the power of the Alruna. Helheim, the dark world of pure potential. There can be no other realm within Yggdrasil that is more misunderstood than Helheim. This seemingly dark and evil abode is in fact nothing of the kind. The fact that it is named Helheim suggests links with other mythological places of darkness and malignant evil, but in the case of Helheim this darkness is the frozen solitude of unrealized potential. Nothing lives within the realm of nothingness. Only the ghostly, darkened shadows of the dead can vaguely be discerned. These empty shells are the ghosts of those who have led a weak life, or died without fulfilling their potential with no possibility of arising anew. Helheim itself is presided over by Hel, the daughter of Loki, the trickster god. Hel's face is half alive and, and young, and half ancient and ravaged to the point of death, thus displaying her dual nature representing the very end and the beginning of life. Hell remains here, ever watchful but silent and unmoving, merely observing her shrouded and hidden realm. Helheim itself is the hidden mysteries of the northern tradition, the true source of runic knowledge and insight. It is from this realm that Odin finally snatched up the runes themselves as he passed into its darkness, having reached the point of death. If Odin had failed to grasp the secret knowledge that is the runes, he would have become an empty shell, forever trapped in the realm of nothingness. But it was the pulse of the Alruna that kept the Allfather from annihilation. This mighty beat reminded Odin of the reasons for his descent into the realm, and the reason for his journey, thus saving him from oblivion. The Nine Mighty Songs The Bind Runes of Yggdrasil Having now examined the nine realms of Yggdrasil, we must return to the Arminen runes themselves in order to determine which runes combine to create the nine mighty songs, the bind runes of Yggdrasil. Once this is complete, we will be able to discern the path that is laid before us, the path first traveled by Odin. What is here presented is are 18 runes of the Armin and Futhark twined in order to create nine bind runes. These bind runes are then matched to the nine realms of Yggdrasil, as previously noted. This is no mere chance. These nine bind runes each have their own meaning, a meaning that is created by taking the individual meaning of the two runes and combining them to form one meaning for each of the nine. It's ugh. Typos for each if the nine, Jesus Christ, of the nine. 
These combined meanings contain within them the meaning and power of a specific realm of Yggdrasil. But before we can examine the path of Odin and determine which bind rune links to which realm, we must first examine these nine bind runes, determining which two combine, determining their name and their meaning. The importance of this cannot be overstated, as there is no other Futharks there are no other Futharks which this matching can be achieved, thus making the Arminen runes unique in this respect. I swear, if, you ha if you're about to publish a book, send it to me first, so I can spell check that shit. <clears throat> the Rune of the Allfather, which is... Com this is a te What in the world? What the fuck was that? Whatever, I'll get to it later. The commies are attacking. This is a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. Why are you doing it no during the live No action is needed. Go away. Alright, well, it works, you guys. <laughs> the president is warning us that I'm about to uh, explain ethnic magic to my subscribers. <laughs> Did you actually hear it? I don't know. Anyway, the Rune of the Allfather. Hegel and Gabor combined to form the Rune of the Allfather. Hegel, which might as well... Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So Hegel is is the, uh, the six lines there. Oh, you did hear it. <laughs> Hegel, well, it's three lines, creating six points meeting in the center there. Hegel is the higher self, or the god within us. And Gibor, which is the cross from upper left to lower right, making the cross with the bent line going from lower left to upper right, which is the rune of the all. So the all within us, so to speak. Which, because we do ancestral worship in this tradition, is, of course, the Rune of the All-Father. The combined force of Hegel and Gabor connects us with the power of the All-Runa, connecting us with Rune Magic and Odin himself. The Rune of the All-Father encapsulates both the shadow form of the All-Runa disguised in the form of Hegel, and Odin, the discoverer of the Rune, represented by Gabor. These two symbolize the heart of the Runic Mysteries, with Gabor connecting us directly to Odin, the runic god, and to the dynamic pulse. That is, at the heart of Yggdrasil, it was this power and knowledge that Odin wished to access when he sacrificed himself upon the world tree. Drawn down from Asgard, Odin traveled down to Helheim to open the gates of, to the mysteries, thus encapsulating the whole of Yggdrasil in that journey. But the true secret lies at the very heart of the tree, where the emanations of the all runa pulse. Thus, this is the rune that symbolizes Odin transformed into the Allfather, god of runes. And then you have the rune of life. The life rune, which is Bea, the joint that looks like the letter B, and Leif, the joint that looks like an upside-down L. Bea is the meaning of life. Leif is the primal rune, the primal law of life. Together, bound as one, life and bear represent the meaning of our mundane earth-bound existence, and the struggle to proceed, pushing ever onwards, in order to find true meaning. We must find our way in this life and face all that is thrown in our path, but we must first understand the laws that govern our existence. This is both at the personal level, but also in within, but also in within, but also is within our own community and culture. The lessons here. Oh my God! It's doing it again. STFU, why why are you doing this now? Why? Beep, beep. But we must first understand the laws that govern our existence. This is both at the personal level, but also is within our own community and culture. The lessons are there to be learnt. However, we must first understand the driving principles behind these lessons and understand that we are ever flowing part of the tide that stretches back into the mists of time, as well as far off into the distant future. The Mankind Rune, 
which is man and year, combined to form the run of mankind. Man is the male principle, spirit. Year is the female principle, matter. Deus ex machina, the two archetypal opposites of year and man, combine to propagate and generate all life in this world, both human and animal. While man brings forth strengths of purpose, drive, and determination, year brings forth person brings forward passion, desire, and the willingness to self-sacrifice, both for personal achievement, <clears throat> excuse me, advancement, and for the good of the all. Each of these defining principles is necessary for a truly fulfilling life. The mankind rune is therefore the rune, the rune of all humanity. Each and every conscious, sentient human being born into this world, however, as well as representing birth, the rune of mankind also represents death and the closure of life. Thus, the combination of year and man represents birth, life, and death of all mankind within the physical realm of this world. So it has a lot to do with the notion of cycles, I guess. Which, interestingly enough, leads us to the next one, which is Vennheim. The cycle of life rune, which is Er and K. Er would be the line going down with the line branching off to the lower left, and K is the line straight with the line branching up to the upper right. Er, the primal spiritual creation. Ka is the growth and intuition. Excuse me. Er and Ka, or K, I like K. Er and K, both in their own way, represent the natural life cycle of all things. From Er, we have primal fire, destroying darkness and allowing growth in, in the sunlight. From K, we have the growth propagated and enabled, but with the primal fire of life, this growth multiplies and is fruitful. The cycle of life rune therefore represents the cycle of growth, having one's being and passing away within this life. Why? Why are you doing this? Shut the fuck up. SDFU. Go away. Shut. I don't even see an option until it shut the fuck up. Oh my god. You're interrupting my stream, president. The cycle of life from there represents the cycle of everyone passing away. This is, however, also true of the year and the cycle of the harvest. The dead, cold ground of the winter gives way to the warming spring when the seeds are planted, and we await their growth during the long, warm summer. With the arrival of autumn, the growth is harvested and stored for the long winter that will inevitably return, and the ground is once again dead, sleeping, awaiting the coming of spring. Next up, yeah, this one. I really, I like this one because of how it looks, really. Something about it. The rune of the word, writ and not. Writ being the joint that looks like an R, not being the line with the horizontal, or rather diagonal, line running through it. Writ is cosmic law, not is Rita, or karmic rune. Rita, the rune of work. The word of the rune represents the universal constant of karmic law, the law of constant evolution, brought about by the eternal balancing of the cosmic forces that surround us. The simple fact that there is no avoiding the consequences of our actions, but we must also re recognize that it is through the laws of karma, cause and effect, that the fluidity of existence remains in place. Without it, all life would simply grind to a halt. Only the force of the word itself is the guaranteed constant. However, this is not a random effect, for the laws of the word are an eternal path, which, with trials and byways leading to many destinations, both destructive and creative, a fact that only the truly insightful can grasp. Therefore, he who is understanding of the word can glimpse the many paths that are laid before him. Although there are few who can see them all, but with knowledge of the combined runic power of Rith and Noth, our eyes are open to the inescapable reality that it is the karmic forces of the word. Thus, we are able to see the entire web of word spreading out before us. Now, perhaps I shouldn't have hydrated quite so much before this, so... 
Excuse me. I need to go use the bathrooms. Intermission time. Everyone, take a break. Listen to the sweet, sweet sounds of presidential warnings of some kind. Alright, I break time's over. Do 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 Now we're on to an interesting one. Again because of how they I mean shit, you know. They're they're all interesting. It's like which one do you like the most? It's kind of just It's a matter of personal preference. So anyway, <clears throat> the primal rune, Fey and Ur. Fey is the joint that looks like the, up, the, up, the upside down F. Ur is the joint that looks like the upside down U with, with, with an attitude. Fey, the primal creation, Ur, the primal cause. These two bound represent the primal force of creation and are combined as the prime movers of the universe. While Fey represents the fire of creation, Ur signifies the causality of the ever-expanding universe. Neither predates the other, but are both operational as a combined unit of primal genesis. They are of pure energy, both as potential and as realization. The origin of all things. One must recognize that fact in order to fully comprehend the primal generative power that is ever flowing in the universe. Whilst the primal fire remains in ever constant, it is also the sparking causality, bringing forth creation of the universe. Bringing forth the creation of the universe? While all is void, the creative fire remains in pure potential, but when existence is manifest, the fire can be found ever burning throughout the cosmos. At the exoteric level, the primal runes represent hidden origins. Wait, the exoteric represents the the hidden that doesn't that doesn't make sense oh my god fucking double meanings all right vosinviets whoa 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 holy shit you don't you don't need to see that all right <clears throat> The Rune of Unity Ice and A form the Rune of Unity. Ice, that joint that looks like a looks like a lowercase L, is calmness and solidity of purpose. A is the joint that looks like lowercase L with the diagonal line traveling through it. Is unity Oh my god. I I don't I don't care, be quiet, go away. Los Alspina Danke. That. A is unity of self and strength through common purpose. The rune of unity is reflective of the dual forces inherent within both ice and A. Each, in its own way, symbolizes courage and the sense of purpose that gives life meaning. Also, at a deeper level, we find that the rune of unity represents the ego and the permanency of self, regardless of life's challenges. It is therefore this solidity of self that remains the one guarantee despite the ever-changing web of word, even when we move in the seeming void between passing away and becoming of the triadic cycle of becoming, existing, passing away, to new beginnings. 
there is still the self, even if only in essence, frozen, silent, awaiting the cycle to begin again, but this sense of unity extends way beyond the individual and encompasses the whole of reality, symbolic of that fact that the universe itself is actually one unified totality. Next up, we have Tyr and Sij. Tyr is the joint that looks like an upward pointing arrow. Sij is the joint that looks like a lightning bolt, which naturally forms the Rune of Light. Tyr, rebirth into the light. Sij, salvation by the light. The Rune of Light is the Rune of Salvation and Rebirth of Victory and Renewal. The Life Rune denotes the power of solar radiance. It is a protective and creative force, offering both protection from darkness and growth from the life-giving heat of the radiant sun, while Sige brings about salvation, protecting us from pure annihilation following death of the physical being. Tyr ensures rebirth into the mortal world in order to begin the process of becoming existing, passing away to new beginnings once again. Thus unified, they signify the promise of regeneration into mortal life and the chance to continue the quest for true knowledge and wisdom, ultimately leading us to the halls of Valhalla. Thus the rune of light is both protective and ensuring rebirth. <clears throat> the magical rune, O's and Thurs, which is an interesting combination, again, with, like, these strange opposite meanings. O's is Odin's rune, and Thurs is obviously often associated with Thor, so we have father and son. So then combining them, wouldn't that create a sort of holy spirit, sort of third aspect, or whatever? Now, O's is a joint that looks like a backwards F, and Thurs is a joint that looks like a triangle pointed right. O's, the power of speech, Odic radiance, Thurs, creation and destruction. Yes, because your sun is created by you and it will inevitably destroy you, which is the natural cycle. Yeah? O's links with the power of Odic radiation in its sonic form. Sonic! symbolizing the magical power of words as well as the breath of life. Thurs represents the s cyclical nature of reality. Oh my god. Seriously, this is like the fourth time. Shut the fuck up. I'm, I'm monologuing. Ugh, thank you. But together they form the magical rune. These powers are locked as potential, only to be realized following full initiation into the runic mysteries. Their hidden in the dark aspect is recognized by the fact that Odin had to reach down in order to gain knowledge of their true mystery. Therefore, that can be seen as symbolic of the inherent power of the magical rune. One must apprehend the magical rune and grasp its meaning before one can unlock the entire runic puzzle and gain a full understanding of their meaning. At an exoteric level, the magical rune symbolizes the dynamic force that is life lived day to day. And this is something that I see often... Um, mildly misunderstood when people talk about Odin getting the runes. They'll talk about how they just kind of fell into his lap. No, 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 no. It was, it took a tremendous amount of effort. He almost lost his soul. He had to snatch them up. He had to go get them. The shit wasn't easy. As much as I respect many other researchers, my autism kicks in pretty hard when they fail to mention that fact. The Nine Realms and the Nine Mighty Songs, Yggdrasil and the Nine Bind Runes. These, then, are the Nine Bind Runes, created by combining two Arminen runes in order to create a bind rune that matches with the realms of Yggdrasil. But which bind runes exemplifies which realm? The image of Yggdrasil below indicates which bind rune matches with each realm of Yggdrasil, but how is this achieved? Which bind rune unlocks a realm of Yggdrasil and thus allows us to traverse the realm, gaining knowledge and insight as we do so? 
as below, as as right in front of you as, as this shit. <clears throat> to understand this question, we must begin at the center of Yggdrasil, the realm of Midgard, realm of manifestation, where all worlds meet. Midgard is the realm of life, of living reality, where not only mankind, but all living creatures have their being. Midgard is also the consequence of all of the dynamic forces in the universe coming into balance. Jotunheim's constant transformation is balanced by Vanaheim's final fruition and end state of completion. Thus, at Midgard, we find that these two forces balance out and give Midgard steady growth, but which is constantly moving forward. Equally, Muspelsheim's fiery sparks of creation and constantly expansive force, which alone are too powerful for our fragile human life to endure it is mediated by Niflheim's static frozen ice and constant constriction. Thus, all four forces are balanced at Midgard, allowing life to continue and prosper uh, within the realms where all worlds meet. Therefore, shut the fuck up. Oh my god, go away. Therefore, we find that the rune of mankind unequally symbolizes this balance, being both representative and encompassing all life on Earth. Now we travel to Niflheim. Abode of constriction and magnetism, the rune of unity. It may seem odd that the rune of unity should be found here, but the quiet frozen stillness of Niflheim reflects the solidity of ego. Regardless of changes in life, the core self remains present. One could almost say that the mag magnetic constriction of Niflheim ensures that the ego is held solid. Even when one passes into the realm of ice, this is encapsulated in both the runes Isa, in solidity of purpose, and A, which is unity of self. Ice represents uh, ice itself stands at the core of Niflheim, representing total unity and the stillness of a fully unified ego, unaffected by movement in the universe and the ebb and flow of change. In A, the solidity is transformed into unity of purpose, which stretches out, reaching for Midgard, the realm of mankind, offering us a pathway back to the dominion of humanity and world of the living. What the fuck? Did I miss something? What the fuck was that? Alright. Move spell sign. Alright. <laughs> The realm of fire and heat, the primal rune, Muspelsheim is the home of the fiery sparks of creation and the power of expansion. Within this realm we find a force of creative energy that drives towards the universe and pulsing with the ever-present beat of the Alruna. The combination of Fey and Ur clearly reflect that primal power of this realm. Fey is the original fire emerging from this realm, while Ur, the primal cause, is the originator of all things empowered by fire and heat of Muspelsheim. I'm gonna need someone's help with that, aren't I? Yeah. Jotunheim, a boat of change and transformation, the rune of the word. The rune of the word represents the change and transformation absolutely essential for the universe to manifest and to move from one state to another. For it is the word that keeps the motion flowing. As Jotunheim is the realm of constant change and evolution, it is therefore the home of the word. But since there would be no change, or indeed life in the universe, without the word, we must realize that the force of the word of constant change is the first dynamic principle of reality, the cosmic law of change. Am I supposed to, like, acknowledge that I know about it? Bruh. See, this is what happens when you don't double check your settings and give certain aspects, certain programs priority. <laughs> Vanaheim, a cycle of life rune. The rune of life combines both Ao spiritual creation and cause growth and nurturing. Together they merge to represent the cycle of growth and a maturity of life unfolding. These are clearly qualities that are to be found within the realm of Vanaheim, where the Vanir reside. These overthrown elder gods of the northern realms represent fertility and growth, both in a human form with Frey and Freya representative of human procreation, and in divine form with Freya becoming the bride of Odin, as well as teaching him the mysteries of magic. The marriage is 
symbolic in that it demonstrated that the new gods, the Aesir, had not simply defeated the older, but through their coming together, a spiritual union was formed to the benefit of both creeds. Svartalsheim. Svartalsheim. Svartalfheim. The abode of emotions, the realm of becoming, is the abode of the ruin of light. Within the underworld of Svartalsheim reside the dark elves who forge and create all things. These dark entities are not evil, indeed their function is a necessary one, for these workers bring all things into being. Without them all space would simply be void. Esoterically speaking, this is the power of eternal becoming and creation, which is representative, which is represented by the rune of light. This may seem at odds with the darkness of Svartalsheim, but the rune of light is the emergence and triumph of the light over the darkness, where the rune, where the runes of light's power is at its greatest as it emerges. For this darkness, as the promise of emergence into light, it is darkness as unfulfilled potential, willed into being by the Dark Elves. The Rune of Light encapsulates within it the power of Sige as salvation, ensuring that we will not be annihilated, but will be reforged following death and the power of Tyr, which symbolizes our re-emergence. A lot of left-hand pathists like to say that only in the darkness can the light shine. And while this is a factually accurate statement, I feel as though it often gets misunderstood. The abode of mind and meaning, the expanse of light, Losalfheim, is the abode of the rune of life. Losalfheim is represented and accessed via the rune of life, for Losalfheim is the realm of mind and intellect. Dark elves. <laughs> Actually, that one, I've, uh, I was talking to someone else about it. Um, the Germanic word Juden is very similar to Jotun, isn't it? So maybe it's a mistranslation. It's not actually uh, Jotunheim, it's more like Judenheim. But that's debatable. Losophime is represented in Axis Fay, the Rune of Life 4. Losophime is the realm of mind and intellect. Faculties that are unique in human life. Also, the rune of life represents the capacity for mankind to grasp and intellectualize the essential meaning of our existence. That life is to be lived, that we must struggle on regardless of what is thrown in our path. Los Alfheim links directly to Asgard. Yeah, this stream's a great example of that. The Los Alfheim links directly to Asgard, the highest spiritual realm. And it is through our capacity to grasp knowledge that we are thus able to ascend to this highest of realms. But while Bear extends towards Asgard, the source of the primal law which it represents, Leif extends downwards towards Niflheim, the realm of ice. But this is a necessary link as it connects the primal law with the Aetir, the life-giving matter that first enabled the creation of all life. Without this link, humanity would not have evolved into sentient human beings capable of attaining knowledge and linking into higher consciousness. Helheim, the dark world of pure potential, is the abode of the magical rune. The combination of Oz and Thurs brings forth the power of rune magic, a power which resides in Helheim, but in Helheim rune magic awaits as mere potential, for it must be unlocked before it can be actualized. It is for this reason that Odin sacrificed himself in order to enter this realm and capture the runes. Yeah, capture, not passively await them as they drop into his hands like ripe fruits. The presence of the O's rune reminds us that Odic radiation emanates from here, a force that spreads out along the vertical axis of Yggdrasil, passing through Midgard and realm of humanity, and it is through the Odic flow that new life escapes the pure potential of Helheim is reborn, and returns to where all worlds meet namely Midgard. However, Helheim's dark potential hides an even greater reality, that it is not only Odic radiation that is to be found in Helheim, but also the Alvruna itself silently pulsing there. 
It is the vibrations of the All Runa that brought Odin here in his quest for knowledge, having felt its vibration echo. Is it? <sighs> Tell you what. Thank you to the uh, the test. There it gives me a chance to rest my voice. Do 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 do. Here in his quest for knowledge, having felt its vibration echo through Asgard but knowing that it can only be reached here in Helheim. The magical rune therefore symbolizes the potential of rune magic, but the power can only be actualized once we have reached and fully understood that nature of Helheim. And since Helheim is the dark abode, it is easy to, easy to see why some would fear the power of rune magic, knowing that the wielder of such knowledge and power must have passed through this dreaded realm. Yeah. Trust me on that, guys. Shamanic initiations are not fun or easy. Realm of Supreme Consciousness and the Highest Ideas, Asgard is the abode of the Ruin of the All-Father. Gibor is the Ruin of the Highest Ideals, the Ruin of Odin in the Highest Realm. Hega links to the All Runa, whose emanations can be most intensely felt here in Asgard. The Rune of the All Father encapsulates the two most essential features of Asgard the House of the Most High, the home of Odin, and the deep core vibrations of the All Runa, whose emanations can be most strongly felt within the House of Spirits. It was from Asgard that Odin's runic journey began, and to here he ultimately returned. But the path which Odin followed is obscured and hidden from us by the light of the conscious mind, whose focus is upon the mundane daily toil of everyday life. In order to access this hidden path, we must go under and explore the deeper realms of consciousness, thus relinking ourselves with the higher ideals of the god within each of us, as represented by Hegel. With the unification of runes with the realms of Yggdrasil revealed, we can now see which bind runes are wedded to which realm, thus giving us a path which we can follow and therefore replicate Odin's journey of the Nine Knights, ultimately bringing us into oneness with Odin and accessing his knowledge of the runes. Let me see... Yeah, I might as I might as well wrap up the chapter here. Bloop. Yggdrasil and the Collective Unconscious, a Jungian analysis. Before we follow the path laid out before us and examine the magical application of the new knowledge gained, let us consider the significance of the world tree at its deepest level. One of the most important concepts within Armin and Esoteric Runosophy, and indeed all runic studies, is that Yggdrasil, the world tree, is representative of reality at all levels of existence and experience. Although this concept seems embedded purely in mysticism, it can also be connected to the analytical psychology of Dr. Carl Jung, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. We have already briefly encountered certain aspects of analytical psychology when considering the meaning of some of the Arminen runes, and during our encounter with Yggdrasil, let us now turn more fully to these ideas and examine the relationship between analytical psychology and runosophy. The archetypes in Yggdrasil, as previously noted, the myth of the world tree, particularly as outlined in, uh, who, what the fuck, fee? F J long O L S V I N N S A M A uh accent L Fjolsvinsvalmal 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 or the saying uh, the sayings of Fjolsvinir circa 12th century is representative of the world in which the Nordic pantheon is encapsulated. Its nine realms represent every possible aspect of existence and as compares and as such compares closely with the Hebrew Kabbalah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's totally Hebrew. That didn't steal it or anything. But whereas the Kabbalah is envisioned envisaged as being essentially two-dimensional, when illustrated as the Tree of Life, Yggdrasil is clearly to be seen as three-dimensional, 
with the middle realms assigned to the four cardinal directions, not something required when drawing the Tree of Life. These realms are symbolic of the powers that they represent. Each one encapsulates an important aspect of the human condition, as well as a mythical realm of archetypal power. And as such, we can also recognize that Yggdrasil encapsulates many aspects of the archetypes, as outlined by the Jung. That's what I'm about, I'm about to start calling him that. Hey, it's, it's the Jung. The, he is, he is the Jungenator. The Jungenator believed that at the deepest level of our unconscious, there is a collective unconscious awareness of archetypal imagery. Imagery that can be found in every culture, society, and social grouping. Universalism. Ugh. These archetypes reoccur in myths, sagas, and stories in every part of the world. And as we shall see, the realms of Yggdrasil are no exception. For within each realm we find such notions as the I, or Ego, which can be wedded to Midgard, where we have our being. The Yuganator's notion of I is the me in the world, of ordinary Ego, as opposed to the true totality of self. And although the Ego in itself not an archetype, when taken with the four realms that surround Midgard only horizontal, we find that the Yuganator referred to as the Ego Compass. In analytical psychology, we find the ego placed at the center of a four-point compass, in which different... Oh my god. I'm not... I don't... I don't care. I don't care. I'm still going to work later. Nothing's changing. Jesus Christ. In analytical psychology, we find the ego placed at the center of a four-point compass, in which different personality personality types will generally gravitate towards some directions more than others, although we are, to varying degrees, governed by all four. The four functions, according to the Yuganator, are the thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. As previously stated, we are influenced by all four by differing degrees. The Yuganator's four formulation of this ego compass places feeling and thinking opposite each other as are sensation and intuition in the makeup of the human consciousness. Without going into the full details of this formu formulation, it is safe to say that the other two forces meter the opposing influences. So according to the Yuganator, if a person has the thinking function, the analytical thinker way of looking at the world more highly developed, the feeling function that is the empathetic go with your heart way of looking at the world will be correspondingly undeveloped. The same goes for sensation and intuition. Sensation is oriented outward and expansive towards physical reality, and intuition is inward and coalescent into psyche and internal reality. The four, the four approaches can be summarized as follows. Although, before I continue, I will say this. In my system, I correspond the 16 different personality types that the Yuganator gave us to the Junger Futhark itself, because there are 16 of those runes. The four approaches can be summarized as follows. One, the thinker who looks inward for answers, thinking intuition. Two, the thinker who looks for to the outside world for answers, thinking sensation. Three, the feeler who feels for answers within, feeling intuition, and the feeler who searches and is empathic with the outside world or feeling sensation. When it comes to the four realms of when, when, when it comes to the four realms surrounding Midgard, we can see how the four functions of consciousness easily compare with the meanings of the four surrounding realms. Niflheim is the realm of constriction and the inward pool of all runa, at the heart of reality. Thus, in Niflheim, we find the inward looking of the intuition of the intuitive function, which looks internally for answers. Niflheim lies opposite Muspelsheim. Muspelsheim is the realm of expansive heat and fiery sparks of creation. This expansive heat is equivalent to outward reaching of the Yuganator's sensation function, feeling its way outward to the external world. Lying at 90 degrees to, the, to these two functions, we have thinking and feeling. The thinking function is comparable to Vanaheim, the realm of wisdom and understanding, particularly in relation to the runes 
<sighs> and magic. The thinker weighs up the options consciously before proceeding, and this weighing up clearly needs wisdom in order to make an informed decision. Opposing this, we have Jotunheim. Jotunheim symbolizes change and constant transformation. This is equivalent to the feeling function that feeling that feels its way through life. The changes, changes of the season and the growth of the crops. In addition to the Jungian compass of personalities, we have realms that directly relate to archetypal images. The anima, which according to the Jungianator, is the feminine side of a male's unconscious mind, is comparable to the realm of Svartelsvaim, which is the seat of emotions and feeling. And the animus is comparable to Loselfheim as the realm of thought and logic, as the male side of the feminine mind. In these forms, we are speaking of archetypal concepts rather than individual people, but this exemplifies the system of balances to be found in Yggdrasil, where these forces merge and find balance is in the eye of Midgard. Eye as in the letter, not the organ. Another Jungian archetype that can be found in Yggdrasil is the hero, for not only do we have Odin, the hero of northern mythology, but also the realm of Asgard itself, the home of the gods. In Asgard, we find the highest ideals encapsulated and symbolizing the goals that we wish to achieve. We also cannot fail to recognize that Odin himself is comparable to the Jungian archetype persona, or mask, for we must take on the role of Odin, wear his mask, in order to accomplish our journey through Yggdrasil, to acquire the knowledge of the runes. However, Odin as self and hero are just two of the many archetypes that Odin represents. Another important archetype to be found in Jung's work is that of the shadow. In analytical psychology, the Jungianator used the term shadow to represent our own dark side, that part of us that contains all the elements of ourselves that we consider unsavory and potentially unpleasant, and yet are an essential part of our personality and therefore cannot be ignored. This too is represented, is represented within Yggdrasil, for Helheim, with its hidden reality awaiting discovery, is the shadow realm of the world tree. However, the world of Helheim is not the dark abode of evil to be feared, although it does encompass the most negative aspects of self and therefore the most negative aspects of humanity. However, if we are to grow and become a truly complete person, we must absorb this negativity. Thus, in doing so, we overcome it and bring it within the totality of self. And, just as each of us has a shadow self, so too has Odin. To represent this shadow side of Odin, the Jungianator uses the dramatic name Wotan. In his essay, Wotan, Civil Civilization in Transition, the Jungianator collected works, volume 10. The Jungianator examines the powerful driving force that the Wotan spirit represents, a driving force that expressed itself in the actions of Germany during the NSDAP period, prior to World War II, where it appeared that an ancient will to power had re-emerged in the population, and indeed there is no denying that the all-consuming force that Odin in the Wotan guise exerted seemed to reinvigorate an economically and culturally, a culturally crushed nation. However, the power and influence of the Wotan shadow can emerge as, uh, as unbridled might, a might which subjugates the weak, that is to say those who do not follow his way of power and domination that the untamed Wotan represents, but this weakness is perceived as being so because it is a strength that the Wotan spirit does not yet understand, and is thus derided. But the Wotan spirit must come to terms with the true nature of itself, including the quiet determination, which may seem as weakness when compared to the frenzied might of the Wotan spirit, and its overt desire to stamp its mark on the world. I told you this book has pause. Talking shit about Wotan shit. However... For the Wotan spirit to re-emerge as the mature Odin, it must absorb its own shadow self and come to terms with its own unbridled rage and the potential danger that it represents for, just as Germany in the 1930s rediscovered its own strength, it was a strength that it later could not control. Ugh. You mean, you know, one nation versus the whole world? 
No way. Having placed its newfound self-belief in the hands of a madman, leading to catastrophe and evils on a scale unprecedented in recent history. Uh, this, this part is painful to read. I should have just stopped. Do, do, do. God damn, recent history. So Wotan himself must overcome his inner darkness of unbridled power and emerge as the matured Odin. Having absorbed and understood the shadow self that Wotan represents, so we can see that not only does Yggdrasil have its shadow realm, but also that Odin itself must overcome and understand his own shadow self. Historically speaking, the Yuganator's Wotan essay was written in 1936, before it was clear just how destructive the Nazi regime was to become. Nevertheless, the Yuganator himself states that Wotan must in time reveal not only the restless, violent stormy... I know, right? Jesus Christ. Just how destructive... So he said, Wotan must in time reveal not only the restless, violent, stormy side of his character, but also his ecstatic and mantic qualities, thus revealing the negative potential of the unbridled Wotan passion, which can lead to destruction and madness. Indeed, one has only to view that Nuremberg rallies of the mid-1930s to see that ecstatic passion to the point of total mania, that that Uncle Adolf had awoken in the German people, particularly with his prophetic claims of the Thousand Year Reich, and that the world was theirs to take. I don't recall ever hearing any of that, but I'm not a perfect historian. I just, I just, uh. While it would be ridiculous to say that the Wotan spirit was the cause of the catastrophes that the Nazis wrought upon the world, nevertheless, we can see how this mythic force did seem to possess those who fell under Hitler's spell. This is why you don't talk about shit you don't understand, okay? If you're gonna, if you study the runes, you're not a historian, do not use the runes as an excuse to talk shit about things you don't fully understand, alright? This, sh this shit pisses me off, man. Yeah, yeah, Britain didn't start it, Poland wasn't raping literally thousands of Germans, no, don't worry about that. Ugh, shit pisses me off, man. Moving on... From the darkness of Odin's shadow self, we find another important symbol of Jungian analysis, which can also be found within Yggdrasil and the runes, namely the mandala. The mandala is an eight-sided sign that represents the totality of self fully formed, encompassing every aspect of self. Jung took the name mandala from Hindu mysticism and, symbol mysticism and symbolism and applied it to more broadly to images that can be related to the totality of self. The nine bind runes of Yggdrasil can thus be thought of mandalas designed to invoke thought and meditation. However, as each bind rune, mandala is asymmetric, asymmetrical in its design, and... God, shut the fuck up. Its design, it reminds us that although each bind rune is important, none can represent the completed journey and are merely signposts making the stages which will ultimately reach completion at the end of our journey. It is also worth noting that standing upon Midgard places us at the center of Yggdrasil, with the eight other realms spread out around us, thus creating the eight-pointed complete mandala surrounding us. Jung was also concerned with the union of opposites, particularly in his alchemical studies where Jung goes to great lengths to demonstrate that the union of opposites is a key element of most alchemical literature and art. This is also true for Armin and mysticism, where the a unification of opposites and the resultant singular essence then being raised to a higher level is all important. As we've already discussed, Yggdrasil is replete with examples of opposites balancing out from the opposition of Niflheim. That's Odin giving you a sign. Yeah, I should definitely wrap this up pretty soon, yeah? Good thing we're almost done. This is the last page before we move on to the next chapter, which I might not even do. Where was I? As we've already discussed, Yggdrasil is replete with examples of opposites balancing out from the... Opposition of Niflheim, the realm of ice and mists, 
and Muspelsheim, the realm of fire and heat. We find the balance of these two realms in Midgard, the realm of mankind. This is also true for Jotunheim, the realm of change, and Venheim, the realm of coalescence, with each realm ensuring the functioning of the other in such a way as to ensure that each is Medi mediated by the other. Indeed, all four of these realms, which lay north, south, east, and west of Midgard, are together responsible for making the world of man inhabitable for sustaining all life there. <sighs> the balancing of powers can also be found with Loselfheim and Svartelsheim, for Loselfheim is the realm of light and of intellect and thought, otherwise known as a dark aspect of yourself because your mind is internal, right? For while Svartalsfheim is dark realm of emotions and feelings, and again these two are balanced within Midgard, which lies at the center of spiritual spirituality, equidistant from the both. From the both. This is by no means a complete analysis of mysteries of Yggdrasil and the runes. Indeed, such a task would deserve a book in itself. However, what is offered here is just a small example of just how important Yggdrasil is to the mysteries of magic of the northern tradition, and that to dismiss such knowledge is irrelevant as irrelevant folk myth, or worse, as a tainted oddity from history, is to ignore such significance. It is therefore the hope of another of the author that, given time, the Arminian tradition will eventually be afforded the respect that its deeper mysteries deserve. Alright. And that's about it. I have stuff to do. I'm sure y'all have stuff to do. Thank you to the two people here. I hope you have a fantastic remainder of your day. And until then, um, hail victory, hail Odin 1488. Peace. Oh my god, shut the fuck up. <laughs>